All right. You guys ready to go? Let's do it. Welcome back. So, this is our last week talking about objects. And we're going to have a chance to introduce some new ideas this week, including one that I think is really useful, um, which is interfaces, something that we'll start talking about today. So, plan for the next couple weeks. Today is the MP2 um, deadline. MP3 will be out today. It's due a week from Friday, right before spring break. Um, MP3 is not the hardest MP that we'll do this semester, but I think that's probably okay. Um, so we have one more week of objects. We're going to review references today. They'll start talking about interfaces. We'll talk more about interfaces on Wednesday. And then we'll fat wrap up our conversation on interfaces on Friday, and we'll talk a little bit about Java memory management as well. Um, any questions about where we are? Reminder that we have a quiz this week starting tomorrow, and then for fun, another quiz uh, this coming weekend that runs on Sunday and Monday. And that's so that we can stay on track, get that last quiz in before winter, uh, spring break. There's no quiz next week on Tuesday, Wednesday. That one's running uh, a couple days early. Okay, so back to Friday. So this is a, a tricky concept, and so we're going we're gonna to return to it. And we'll do some more review today than we might normally do, because references are a really important concept to understand in order to understand um, not only Java itself, but the kind of things we're going to start talking about next week once we start to talk about data structures and algorithms. So to review, a reference is something that allows me to refer to another thing. A reference gets me to the object that I'm interested in working with in Java, but a reference is not the thing itself. So a reference refers, so we're going to start talking about variables that we've been talking about before as holding objects, as referring to an object. So in Java, the variables that we use to store objects actually store object references. They store a reference that allows me to refer to the object. A reference is not the same thing as the object itself. So we refer to these variables as reference variables. So in this case, um, me and you are both reference variables that store a reference to an object of type person. Down on line 14, I create the first new person object that exists in this system. And remember, whenever I create an instance of an object, you're going to see the new keyword, always. Sometimes it's hidden behind another function, but somewhere I'm going to see new. That's the only thing in Java that creates a new instance of a particular type of object. In this case, I'm creating a new object of type person. So here, bef even before I get to line 14, I have two person references, but I have no person objects. It's not until line 14 that I create my first person object, and I save a reference to it in the reference variable me. When I copy me to you in line 15, there's still only one Java object in the system, the one that I created on line 14. I haven't called new again. So I have one instance of type person. I have two references of type person. Before I ran line 15, both of those references, uh, sorry, before I ran line 14, both those references returned, uh, referred to null. They did not refer to an object. So null is the special value that we use to indicate that a reference does not hold anything. It doesn't refer to anything. That's why I can't call its methods and use any sort of dot notation on it. Because to use dot notation, I need to refer to something. So after line 15 executes, I now have two references in my system. I have one object. Both those references refer to the same object. And so if I compare the two references using the double equals syntax that we've been telling you not to use, that's going to return true. And that's because literally these refer to the same object. Now, if I change you on line 17 to now refer to a new person, now I've created two person objects. The first one was created with the call to new on line 14. The second one was created with the call to new on line 17. Now I have two person objects, I have two reference variables that store a reference to a person object, and now when I print off whether or not those reference variables are equal, the answer is going to be false, because they refer to two different objects. Let me ask a question. Why, every time I, I call new, 
I have a variable over here on the left that I'm assigning the result to. What would happen if I just called new person without saving the result? Why, why would I never do this? There's never a reason to, to do this in Java. Why not? Yeah, way in the back. You speak up a little bit? Yeah, so if I create a new object and don't store a reference to it, I can't do anything with it. I can't change its values, I can't call its methods, I can't pass it to a function, and so there's, there's never a reason to just call new person without saving the result somewhere. If I did that, again, that's a, the answer is perfectly correct, I just, it's gone, right? There's no way to refer to it. If I can't refer to an object in Java, it might as well not exist. And in fact, on Friday we'll talk about how Java takes variables that nobody can refer to and makes them go away. It's magic. This was one of the things that was innovative about Java when it came out. It's pretty standard now in a lot of different programs. So again, a reference is not the thing that it refers to. A reference is a way to get to, to access the thing that it refers to, but it is not the same thing. So a, a, my phone number is not the phone. The street address is not the house that's there, right? Your social security number is not you. These are references. I can make copies of my address and give them to a bunch of people. I still only have one house. So that's always the way to think about it. If I copy the reference, it does not copy the object it refers to. Again, if I give someone in the class my phone number and they make a copy for a friend, I still only have one phone, even if you have two references to it now. So copying a reference does not copy the thing it refers to. It just makes a copy of the reference. All right, so again, copying a street address doesn't copy my house. All right, so let's go through the diagram again. I, this, again, this is really important to understand because once we start talking about data structures, we're gonna be doing a lot of work with references um, and, and a lot of what we do with data structures is essentially set up new ways of storing references to existing Java objects in ways that allow us to implement certain types of algorithms efficiently. All right, so here's my simple example. When I start, I have a reference variable called me. That reference variable refers to nothing. It's null. And so if I try to call me.toString, this is going to cause an error because me is empty. It refers to no instance of an object. Once I assign it, once I create a new person, so essentially the right side of this line is responsible for creating this person object. The default age is zero because that's the default value of an uninitialized int in Java. And then I take the result of this and I save it into my reference variable me. So remember when we read assignment, we go right to left. So I create a new person object that gets set up over here and then I assign the reference to it to me. So me now refers to this person object. If I copy the reference, I do not have two people. I have one person. I have two references now to the same person. And any changes that are made by either holder of that reference to the underlying object are visible to both. So I can change the age of this person object by using either me or you. They refer to the same object. So if I set, you know, if I use me to set the age of this person object to 10, and then I use you to retrieve the age of that person object, I'm gonna see the updated result. I'm gonna see 10 here, um, because both of those references refer to the same object. When I call a function in Java and pass it an object, what I'm really doing is I'm passing it a copy of a reference to that object. That means that a function can modify the object, any object that it has a reference to. So again, here's an example. I have a, a function called birthday. Um, when birthday runs, so I've set up um, my person reference here, and I've set it equal to a new person with age 38. When birthday runs, it gets a copy of the reference to the person because I passed it one. I passed it a, I passed it me. So it takes me, it copies it into a variable called to set. You can choose that to be anything you want. 
Now, at this point, as birthday starts to run, I have two copies of a reference to that object. Birthday is going to use its reference to increment the age, and then it's going to return the new age. So this is going to print 39, but when it finishes running, um, yeah, so if I print me.age here, once the function exits, I don't have that reference copy anymore. I still have a reference to the object that I was holding when the function ran called me, and I can use that reference to print off the age. And I'm gonna see the modification to the object that was made by the birthday function. All right, so, and, and then, you know, this is our example using arrays, arrays of references. So here I create um, arrays hold object references, right? So here I create an array of uh, references to people on line nine. I populate that with a bunch of new person objects. I create another array of references to person objects. I populate that uh, with copies of the references from the first array. So when I get to line 17, I have 10, is it 10? No, I have eight, eight person objects. Oh, no, sorry, I have four person objects. I created them right here in this loop. I have two arrays of size four that hold person references to person objects. So I have eight references to person objects, four of them in people and four of them in same people, but I've set them up so that the four in people refer to the same four objects as the four in same people. And so again, I can use the references I have in the people array to modify the ages, and then I can use the references I have in the same people array to print off the updated value. Questions about this? This is kind of where we got through last time. Again, this is not, um, not the easiest thing to wrap your minds around at first, but this is incredibly important. The references show up over and over again, right? This is not something that you're gonna learn about in 125 and never see again. This is something that you're gonna learn about hopefully a little bit, be exposed to, and then see again and again and again, because references get used all over the place in computer science under the guise of a variety of different names. Sometimes we call them pointers. Sometimes we call them, you know, um, well, actually, C++ does have an idea of a reference. Like, we have different names for them. But fundamentally, it's the same idea. I have something that allows me to refer to the app that I can copy around to do other things. Okay, awesome. Um, so we've talked about how to copy references. Copying references is easy. I just create a new reference variable and assign it to the value of an existing reference variable. That doesn't copy the object, it copies the reference. So when I'm done, I have two references, but just one object, whatever the first reference was holding. What about if I wanna copy the object itself? So this is more work, you know? And, and to some degree, this sort of makes sense with the analogies that we've been using when we talk about references. It's more work to copy my house than it is to copy an, a piece of paper that has my address on it. That's easy. So there are a couple of options in Java. There is no built-in way to do this in Java. I wanna point that out. And there's a reason for this, because it's non-trivial. So you guys have been working on MP2. Think about some of the state that you have in your board and whether or not it would be cop it's possible to copy that into a new board. What does it mean to copy the board? Does it mean it has the same players? Does it mean they've made all the same moves? Does it mean it has the same size? I mean, there's certain things that we could probably agree on, but there's other things that might, you know, differ from object to object, from class to class. And this is one of the reasons why Java sort of doesn't have this built in. It allows you to do it for your class if it makes sense. And here's some of the ways that you can do this. So again, object provides this clone method, but this really doesn't do what you think. More common is if you, want to cop if you want to allow your object to be able to be copied, you can provide what's called a copy constructor. Copy constructor is a constructor that takes a single argument. That argument is a reference to another object of that type. So here I've got a person, so here's a person constructor that takes an int to set the initial age, but I've also provided a second person constructor that takes another existing person. So once I have one person, if I want to create a new copy of that person, I'm going to use the copy constructor. And what you can see is all this does is it copies the age from the other person object. If my person had other fields, I might need to copy those as well. There might be certain fields that I don't copy because 
I don't think it's appropriate to copy those fields. So this is what gives you the power to define how your custom types, how your classes are going to be copied. You can create a copy constructor, you can put whatever you want in there. I mean, obviously there's certain things that don't make sense. It wouldn't make sense not to copy any of the fields, um, but you can choose how to do this. Okay. So now this is, now this has the, this is one of the reasons, other reasons that Java doesn't do this by default, right? So this has the potential to create some problems. Okay, so let's look at this different person object, okay? So here I've got a person, and um, here the person has a pet. This person object is defined to have a pet. Obviously everybody has a pet. Probably should be an array of pets, um, but in this case just one. Um, and when I copy, so I have a copy constructor up there, and when I copy, my copy constructor essentially just copies the pet from the other person that's passed. What's the problem with this? Yeah. Yeah, what am I actually copying here? Excuse me, guys in the back, can we not talk throughout the entire lecture? Yeah, that's you. Thanks. So what am I actually copying here? Am I copying the object, the pet object? No, I'm copying a reference to the pet object. So when I'm done, I have two people, two persons, I should use a different class that actually has a, a, a plural that works. Um, so I have two person objects, but those two persons are now sharing the same pet, which is probably not what we expected. So for example, the first person renames their pet, the second person is gonna see that change because what they have is a reference to the pet. They don't have a copy. So what do I need to do here to fix this problem? Let's say what I want is when I copy a person, I want the new copy of the person to have a pet if the other person had a pet, but I also want that person to have their own pet. The pet might start out with the same name or whatever. How do I fix this? Yeah. Yeah, so I actually need to now copy the pet. So what we've done, if, if we do this, this is something um, in computer science that's known when we copy objects as a shallow copy. The reason is I'm only kind of copying the top level. So if I don't copy the pet, what I have is a shallow copy. My first person and the copy of a person, um, they may have their own different fields. So for example, if the second person decided to, to get a new pet and replace their pet reference, that would work okay. But any changes that are made to the pet are visible to both. If I start copying everything. So let's say I say, okay, well, pet is an object, therefore I need to copy it, so I call its copy constructor. Now, pet might have a name that's a string. What's the problem with that? Well, a string's an object, so now I have to call the string copy constructor. Right? So you can see how starting off by trying to do a copy in one place can now force me to do copies in a bunch of different places. And this is one of the things that makes uh, doing a deep copy complicated. So you might, might imagine what happens if, the, if pet doesn't provide a copy constructor. Remember, this is optional. You don't have to create one. Yeah, so this is the kind of problems that we can run into when we're trying to do this. I just wanted you guys to see this, be aware of what's happening. If I really want to make two completely de detangled, there was a part of MP2 that was, that was designed to force you to think a little bit about this, right? So when you uh, return a copy of the board, you need to do that in a way that the board that you return doesn't have references to the same players that your board does. If it does, then the person who calls it now has you know, a way to mess with your game, essentially. Okay. So this is, so this is something that you, know, you guys have seen a few times on the homework, but I wanna talk about it now, right? So now that we've distinguished between references and object instance, these underlying objects, we can talk about two different types of equality in Java. So we, when we started using objects, we told you, don't do this, right? Don't compare one reference variable to another reference variable using the double equal syntax because it doesn't do what you think. Well, now you know what it does. It actually compares the references. If the references literally refer to the same object, 
then it's true, but otherwise it's false. Equality is a much more complicated concept. What does it mean for two objects to be equal? Again, think about this when it comes to the game you guys are working on for MP2 or for some of the other examples we've seen. The nice thing, so remember, in Java, every object inherits an equals method. And by default, what the equals method does is it compares the two objects, it compares the two references. If those references are the same, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. But in a lot of cases, we want to provide a more expansive notion of what it means for two different objects to be equals. And by providing this function called equals, Java allows you to do that. So when you design a class, you are in charge of determining whether or not it, what it means for uh, two instances of your class to be equal. You do this by overriding a method called equals. That method takes a reference to another object, and it should return true or false depending on whether or not you consider that other object to be equal to the object that equals is called on. And you can do this in a variety of different ways. So here's an example. So this is a person class that only has an age. Well, I've decided that two people are equal if they have the same age. Now that's probably a little bit too broad, but given the amount of data that I'm storing on my person class, that's the best I can do. So you imagine if I added a name, if I added like a social security number, I might, con 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 uh, you know, I might consider two different persons to be the same if they have the same social security number. There's different ways to implement this, but now it's up to you to decide how to do it. Not every um, variable on your object is going to be equally useful when it comes to determining whether or not two objects are equal. So two people are not equal if they have the same name, right? This is something that we're discovering as, as people do these sort of ill-conceived attempts to figure out who should be able to vote, right? John Smith is a pretty common name. So to, everyone with that name is not the same, right? There's a lot of different people with that name. We, in, in big cities, you have a lot of different people with the same name in the same county. They might live on the same block, right? So this is a difficult thing to do. It's one of the reasons why a lot of countries have some sort of ID system, right? Whether it's a social security number or other forms of ID to provide some sort of unique value to each person so that we can decide whether or not um, they're equal. But when you write your Java classes, you get to decide what it means for two objects to be equal. And you do that by overriding it. Now, if two references are equal, then they refer to the same object. In that case, if I take those two references and call dot equals, the result should be true. Like, if I have two references to the same object, are those two ob is an object equal to itself? I would hope so. Now, if you want to be a joker, you can uh, override equals to return false, always. So that means that your object is never equal to anything else, including itself. That is probably not the right thing to do, but you can do it. So again, almost always true. I would say always true unless something very wrong is happening, right? Like you've broken equals by returning false. If the two references are not equal, then it's possible that those two objects are still considered equal by that class. So if the two references are the same, dot equals should return true. If the two references are different, dot equals may return true if it considers those two objects to be the same based on however it defines equal. All right, let's see if I have a little, we'll come back to this in a second. Uh, ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 do, wanna, I do wanna talk about this. Okay. So the other thing people start to notice that's important to understand about references is now that we're, now that we're di are distinguishing between the reference and the object, the reference and the instance of the object that it refers to, one thing you might notice is that Java uses the reference type, not the underlying object type, not the instance type, when matching method signatures and when looking up, um, when determining what functions can be called. So if the reference type doesn't match, Java will try to upcast the reference type to match a particular um, function signature until the call fails. So let's look at an example of this. So down here, 
I've got a little example here where I create a pet. I have a reference variable, lowercase pet, that I set up to refer to a new instance of the pet object that I create with new on the right side of line 16. I then call a function called what. That function is being passed a reference of type pet. Then on line 18, I upcast pet to an object. And this is always safe to do because every Java object is an instance of capital O object. So I'm upcasting pet to an object. I store that reference in small o object. And then I call what again, but now I'm call calling it with the object reference. Now again, this whole time, I have one object, and the type of that object is pet. It does not change. On line 17, I'm calling what and I'm passing it a pet reference, and on line 19, I'm calling what and I'm passing it an object reference. What you'll see is that the reference type determines what function gets called. That's pretty interesting, right? So here, I call what, pet is a pet reference, and I get this version. So I've got two versions of what. This is method overloading, right? One of them takes a reference to a pet. The second takes a reference to an object. I call what on line 17, and what runs? The version of what that takes a reference to a pet. I call what on line 19, and what runs? The version of what that takes a reference to an object. The reference type also determines what I can do with that particular type of object. So let's do this. Let's say, let's add a, um, let's add an age to my pet. And so now here, let's go down and, and print the age. And that works. So let's set the default age to eight or something like that. So we get it. Okay. Here, okay, so let's try this. Oh, oh, dot age. Ah, there we go. So what happened here? So once I've upcast, once I change the reference to an object, remember the, the, the pet is still a pet. I'm just using an object reference to refer to it. Once I have an object reference, I can't use dot age anymore. And this goes back to our discussion about polymorphism. Not everything that I can pass to the version of what that takes an object as an argument has a dot age field. Strings don't have a dot age, for example. Lots of other objects that I can create don't have a dot age. So up here, I can do things like I can print o dot hash code. Every object has a hash code. I can print o dot to string. Every object has a two string method, uh, but I can't use methods or fields that aren't defined on capital O object. So the reference type also determines the visibility of various fields on the object. When I use a pet reference to refer to my pet object, I can access the age. When I use an object reference to refer to my pet object, I can't. It's not every object will have a dot .h questions about this before we go on. This is one of the more important examples to understand. David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's wrong. It should take an object. Yeah, yeah. So, so David has spotted the fact that in order to correctly overwrite, overwrite equals, my equals method needs to take an object. Because I can call equals on any, on any Java object. Now, the first thing you do frequently in your equals method is you say, if the, if the reference that's passed isn't actually the same type as me, then I'm not equal to it, right? But again, you could, you could define that differently, right? There might be another class that you're actually, you can be compared to, right? So you can be equal. Yeah, it's a great point. So there's a bug in this slide. I'll try to remember to fix it. Great question. Other questions? Okay, good. So, did this. Last call for questions on 
object references. Object references in any of the stuff we've talked about over the last, this will be on this week's quiz and definitely on this weekend's quiz. And again, this, this, this is, this is tricky. This is a new, you know, don't, don't underestimate this. This is a new concept that we're introducing, but it's also incredibly useful. Something that you will see over and over. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, whenever I'm referring to an object, when we talk about code, am I always referring to a reference? Yes, essentially. We're always talking about a reference variable, right? I'll try to be as clear about that as possible. For equals, you do, in order to match the signature. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, if I override equals, do I have to take an object? And the answer is yes. If you override it and don't take an object, you don't match the signature, and so you get the default implementation or whatever. David. If you take in an object, don't you then have to Right. Exactly, yeah. So, so let's, let's just do this for fun, right? Um, let's, let's override equals. I'm gonna take other. So, and, and this is one of those methods that IntelliJ can actually generate for you. Um, it, it's pretty cookie cutter. So typically the first thing we do in equals is we say, we check for null, we're gonna return false. Then we say if um, other if other is not a pet, I'm also gonna return false. So now, so, so, so David's question was, don't I have to downcast it before I can actually compare the fields? Absolutely, yeah. So now I know that I can safely downcast this reference. So now I'm gonna say pet other as pet is equal to, I'm gonna do my downcast, and now I might do something like um, age is equal to other as pet dot age. Right, so here's an example where I'm just comparing based on that one age field. If I had other age fields here, I might use them, or sorry, if I had other instance variables here like name, size, or whatever, I might use them. Um, I might not, depends on how you wanna define equality. Yeah, but this is the, gen this is the general pattern, right, for, for writing equals, right? You know, you check for null, um, you reject other types, downcast, and then check fields as appropriate. And this is more or less what IntelliJ will generate for you if you ask. It, when, when you do this on IntelliJ, it will, or sorry, Android Studio, it'll ask you like which fields do you want to compare and you can choose which to compare and which not to compare. Yeah, great question. Other questions about object reference? Okay, so. Our last idea in object-oriented programming, but really something that is, again, bigger. I mean, that's one of the fun things about objects. When we start talking about objects, we're talking about Java. But as we go along, we stop talking about Java objects, and we start talking about real fundamental issues with system design. References are one of those. We will talk about references again in several other contexts later, where they get used that are not inside Java. Interfaces is the same idea. So interfaces are incredibly important when you build a computer system, particularly large, more complex computer systems. Computer programs have interfaces, computer systems have interfaces, right? So what is an interface? An interface is really what it sounds like. It's a place where two things come together and interact with each other. So it's a boundary between two parts of a system. So the screen, that you guys are looking at right now. That's one of your computer's interfaces for dealing with you. This is a human computer interface. You're on one side, the computer's on the other. It's displaying information. If you have a touch screen, it also allows you to input information. This is one example, right? This is an example of an interface between a human and a computer, but interfaces can and do occur between two pieces of software, between software and hardware, so if there's an interface that allows you to plug in a mouse to your computer and have it work um, between computers and their users, like the screen and your touchpad and things like this, and then various permutations of these other components. So an interface, again, is a, is a place where two parts of a computer system come together and interact with each other. 
The reason why this is important is there's structured communication that happens across an interface. So it's very important to get interfaces right, to figure out how a particular interface is supposed to work. So if you think about, again, your screen, there were years where people interacted with the computer by typing commands into something that essentially looked like a big Word document, except uglier. This is something called the command line. So the computer sits there, you type in some cryptic command, it does something, it might tell you a little bit about what happened, and then you type in another command. For a while, I know you guys are way too young to appreciate this. I'm almost too young, young to appreciate it, but this is how you interacted with computers. This thing called Windows, and eventually Apple's takes on this and stuff like that, and, and you know, the origins of these ideas go back much farther than this, but the whole idea that your computer is going to draw like a window for you to interact with, that you can move around and resize, that was a new interface. It was a new computer, human computer interface that dramatically improved our productivity. Or at least, maybe not our productivity, because actually using the command line could be pretty powerful, but at least made it much more um, possible for lots of different types of people to use computers. This is an example of an interface and about communication over an interface. So as Windows comes out with new versions, people will say, oh, I really couldn't, you know, I really had a hard time using Windows 8 or something like that, right? A lot of times that's because a particular uh, operating system or a particular version of a, a computer software has a bad interface. I've got a couple of apps on my phone that I'm always fumbling around trying to figure out how to get them to do certain things because they have a bad, in my opinion, interface, right? Uh, they, don't, they don't interact with me very much or very well. They haven't thought about how to manage to structure the communication across that interface. So, so here's some examples. Of, of interface, you know, sort of trying to draw from real life as much as possible, right? So there are lots of interfaces between two pieces of software. So for example, when you guys work on an MP, there's an interface between our test suites and your code. You guys didn't realize this until now, but for example, if you, you can solve the problem, you guys could create a beautiful game of Connect N that fails all of the test cases. Why? Because you didn't name your methods right, right? And you didn't do it exactly kind of how uh, we want it, right? So there's an interface between the test suite and your code that allows us to test it. So that's an example of an interface between one piece of software and another piece of software. We've documented that interface. We gave you lots of Java docs so you can figure out what to do. But that's an interface between our test suite's software and your code software. So there are interfaces between software and hardware. So for example, uh, that Chromecast down there that's broadcasting the slides is actually a little computer. But at the end of the day, there's a little HDMI uh, connection that comes out of there. And so somewhere, there's a piece of software running on that Chromecast that's responsible for figuring out what signals to put out over that uh, HDMI cable so that you can see the slide. Well, we've talked about several examples of computer user interfaces. These are all over the place. And again, something that you, know, you really appreciate when it works computer feels very intuitive, um, and it's very frustrating when it doesn't, right? So this is how you guys uh, process information sent to you from the computer. You input information using a mouse or a keyboard or trackpads or new fancy methods that we haven't even figured out yet. We're going to focus on software interfaces. And we're also going to focus for the next couple of lectures on the definition of an interface as provided by Java. But I want to make sure that you understand that Interfaces are not a concept that's confined to Java, and they're not a concept that's even really confined to you know, uh, this type of programming in general. They occur in lots of different places. Okay, so we're gonna, so we've, we've talked about kind of interfaces in the large, and what they mean, and all the different places they occur. Now we're gonna start looking at interfaces in Java. What is a Java interface? What does Java mean by the idea of an interface? Java's idea of an interface is not that unusual. Okay, and it fits in pretty well with what we've talked about before. Um, there are other languages. So in Java, an interface has a very specific meaning that you're going to see in a couple of slides. There are other languages where interfaces also have a very specific meaning. So Go, for example, the new language being developed by Google uh, for high-performance computing. Well, maybe not for high-performance computing. For, for high-performance systems, um, you know, as a replacement to older languages like C and C++. 
In Go, there's a specific idea of what an interface is. It's part of a language. There are other languages where interfaces are defined by convention. So an interface means that here's a library, here's documentation about what you can do with it. That's an interface. But there's no built-in concept in the language. But it doesn't matter. When you start developing real software, you are always are going to be, have to think about interfaces. How to use them, how to define them once you start sharing code with people and working in a larger team. A lot of what allows large-scale software development to take place is that people work on components of a system that each fit together. And the reason they fit together is because people have de decided and discussed and documented how the interfaces work. So if you have good interfaces in your system, you can have thousands of developers working on different parts of it, and when they're done, everything still fits together. If you don't have good interfaces, it's a mess. Everybody's in each other's way, and nobody gets anything done. So I, again, I also want to make sure that we don't lose sight of how general this is. So in, every jo in Java, every object has an interface. You don't have to implement an interface for this to be true. The interface is really just the set of public methods that a class provides. That's the interface to a class. So if you add a public method to your object, to your class, that's now part of its interface because that's something that somebody else can use. This is why we encourage you to write Javadoc. You guys don't do it very well. Um, but the reason why we encourage you to write Javadoc is because one of the reasons that, one of the things that allows interfaces to work well is when there's good documentation about how to use them. Okay. Uh, I just said that. Awesome. Okay. So let's look at our first example of a Java interface. Again, this is a thing, right? This is public, this is a valid Java code. This looks a little bit like something we've seen before, but here's the definition of an interface in Java. So I see I've got the public keyword, which I think I have some idea about what that means right now, but then I see a new keyword I haven't seen before, interface. And then I see a name, I see an open and closed bracket, and then I see something that looks kind of like a function declaration, right? I've got a return type, I've got a name, I've got a list of parameters, um, except there's no body, right? So that's what's weird here. So if you squint a little bit, this sort of looks like a class, right? If I take interface and replace it with class, and if I actually had a body for this method, it would look like a class declaration. But it's not, this is an interface declaration, and this is what they look like. So instead of telling you how to implement add or, sh or, or telling Java how to implement add, I'm just telling Java that this interface contains a method called add that takes two parameters. And this is how interfaces look in Java. They sort of look like empty class declarations. Just method signatures, no implementation. We also typically don't define variables in an interface, only methods. Except they can declare both. But typically, we don't, we don't use them, right? It's really just for constants that we're going to use variables. So what we're going to focus on in this class is methods, right? Interfaces as defining methods that, um, that are part of the interface. OK. Once I have an interface declared, a class can then implement it. So on line one, I have the same interface that I just showed you. It's a public interface called add. It contains a single function called lowercase add that takes two arguments. I don't know what it does, but that's um, what the interface declares. Now here, I have a class. So this is a class declaration. Again, this looks similar to stuff that we've seen before, except I've got a new piece to it. So I've got a public class called adder. Adder declares one public method. But when I declare my class, I have something new. I have this implements keyword. That's how I declare that my class implements a particular interface. So I'm declaring that my class called adder is going to implement the add interface. What does that mean? It means that it has to provide a function called add that takes two arguments, first being an int, the second being an int. And indeed, I have provided an implementation 
of that function in my class. So on their own, an interface. So we talked about classes as blueprints, and that was an appropriate way to think about them at the time. Interfaces are really blueprints. Interfaces are blueprints for the class. So what the interface says is, in order to implement this interface, here are the methods that you have to provide. It does not tell you how to provide those methods, and that is incredibly important. Because part of why interfaces are so useful is how they are implemented can vary from class to class. And we're going to see when we talk about a particularly useful interface for comparing two Java objects together that this is really important. So interfaces tell you don't do anything useful. Instead, they leave the implementation up to the classes that implement them. And to declare that you're going to implement an interface, you use the implements keyword as part of your class declaration. Yeah, and so in order to implement, so this is a simple interface that only contains one method. But in order to implement an interface, you have to do, implement all of the methods that it, that include. So if interface add included subtract and multiply, maybe I have to call it math now, I'd have to implement all of those methods. All right, so let's see how this works. These examples work fine in my slides. Oh, right, okay. Ah, okay. So now, What's wrong here? What's wrong is that I'm trying to uh, use add or as an interface type add, and it doesn't implement add. So let's implement add. Again, in order to do that, I say I'm going to create a public yeah. Oop, implements. There you go. Now, here's one thing I want you to, to notice. I don't have to, the, the interface doesn't necessarily, the interface is going to tell me things about what I'm supposed to do. But it doesn't require it. So you might think, add, you should add the two numbers, right? Well, I'm not going to do that. I've decided to return zero. Right? As far as Java is concerned, I've implemented that interface. So how classes implement the interface is something that's usually indicated as part of the interface documentation, but there's no way to tell whether or not it's appropriate. And the reason for this is that one of the power of interfaces is letting classes do things their own way. This is a silly example because adding two numbers always works the same way. So you wouldn't see examples for different classes who want to implement this differently. But when we talk about more useful ways that we use interfaces, you will see those examples. Um, and that's exactly what they're for. So we've talked a little bit about upcasting to um, when we talk about object references. I can do the same thing with interfaces. So I can take an object that implements an interface, and I can upcast it to any of the interfaces that it implements. So here, on the right side of line 12, I'm creating a new object of type adder. And then I'm upcasting that to an add to an, an instance of the, to an, sorry, to a reference variable that holds a reference to an interface, something that implements the add interface. So that's what add is going to hold. If I do that, I can call any of the methods that are defined on that interface. I cannot call any other methods that are defined on that object. So for example, line 13 will work, because add is part of the add, or, uh, add, is part of the add interface. Line 15 will not, because multiply is not part of the add interface, even though it's declared as public as part of the add class. All right, I think I should stop here because I'm out of time. Let me just have a, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up here next time. Um, I'll get the, uh, I forgot to put the announcement slide up. So announcements for today, MP2 is due at five. Good luck finishing up. It looks like people are making good progress on that. MP3 will be out tonight. Please don't stall starting MP3 because it's due a couple days earlier than usual because of break. It is shorter to accommodate for that. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Have uh, good luck finishing up MB3. Enjoy lab. <laughs>